Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very historic day in the chess world. Number one, and very important, this is the first time I have ever worn a backwards cap in one of my YouTube videos, and I've made probably around 3,000 of them at this point. So that's number one. Number two, and more importantly, the Indian national team has officially won the Olympics of chess, and not just the Open, they also won on the women's side. The men and women of India are the Olympiad champions of 2024. And that's not, even, that's not even the half of it. I'm going to show you some games, and then I'm going to check out of our Airbnb, <laughs> because uh, it's almost time to go, but today the Olympiad games ended uh, a bit early, so I woke up and they were already almost done. Going into the final round, the only way that the men could somehow not finish in gold medal spot was if they lost 4 nothing. And if, like, somebody else won for nothing, so it was un unbelievably difficult, and the women just had to win their match and see what happened. Here we go. So India is playing... And, and by the way, after I cover all of this, I'm going to give you some more context. I'm going to give you some more statistics, um, because what is happening right now in India is insane. The story goes, the, the legend goes that chess was invented in India. I don't have any evidence of that because I was not alive at the time, but that is the, that is the historical... Um, I, I suppose, like, the, the origins of chess are rooted in India. And India has now reclaimed chess and has enhanced chess and has made it better. So if you're watching this from India and you've never played chess, you haven't taken it too seriously, maybe it hits the YouTube algorithm now, I don't know. If it hits the YouTube algorithm outside of India, yeah, India's back. They're better than ever. They're minting more grandmasters now um, than any country at any pace. It is unbelievable. So India, Slovenia... Um, this is a very unexpected last round pairing. Slovenia has an incredible Olympiad and their board one, Vladimir Fedoseev, shows up and plays d4, knight f6, and then he plays the London. And I almost feel like it was like a level of uh, appeasement um, that he was... By the way, you might have just heard a Windows noise. I was just closing. Uh, I had my video editing software open. Uh, this one will not require editing. We're going to one take it and then get out of here before I get hit with a late fee. Because Airbnb now is like, you know, you don't, you don't clean every single spot. You, you know, you don't cook the host the meal. You get a $100 fee. Um, D5, E3, C5. So it almost felt like, you know, Fedoseev is trying to subdue uh, the power of Gukesh by playing a London system. He plays Queen A4 to put some pressure on him on the queen side and Bishop B5 and Queen C8. And from the opening, it was clear Fedoseev knew what he was doing. Um, he, he, he obviously knew the line quite well, but here rook c1 is the incorrect plan. And the right plan here for white to continue to make improvements is to play h3, bishop h5, because of course if takes, then here. And now white is supposed to chase down this bishop with knight h4. And then the system is something like this. Let's say bishop e7, knight g6, hg. There's a very, very famous system here for many different lines, such as bishop to f1. It might not exactly be bishop to f1. It could also be bishop to e2. But basically, white repositions the bishop to this diagonal. And this is very counterintuitive. Uh, if you don't know this maneuver with, you know, h3, g4, I mean, it's not something that you can come up with. at The, I, the only reason I'm coming up with this is because I had some time to think about it and remember it, plus I have... The engine, but the engine doesn't even like bishop f1, it likes bishop e2. Anyway, Fedosev goes rook c1, and somehow, the cruelty of chess, he's already, like, almost worse. It's because this bishop is, like, gonna trade off for this knight, which is the incorrect plan, so a6, bishop takes. And Fedosev must have thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm doubling his pawns, and now I'm gonna play the very natural follow-up c4. Like, I played rook c1, I have my pawn on c4 here, here, but like every opponent in this Olympiad, you just sit down against Gukesh. And everything is not what it seems. <laughs> like, you, you think you have something going, but Gukesh has either evaluated the position better than you, because that's really what chess is. Like, most of these players are looking at the same position. Um, you're either evaluating or coming up with ideas the wrong way. And F6, just with the simple idea of creating some counterplay and also just preventing White from going forward, suddenly White has no forward plan. Like, White is just worse. You know, white doesn't have any pawn play. White, like, white can take, and black says, okay, thank you. You've just undoubled my C pawns. Now I'm just better. Right? So you, you, you can't do anything. So Fedoseev plays knight b3, and that's just another step in the wrong direction because he's destabilizing his queen side. He's also giving black a target. Gukash is like, okay. 
<laughs> right? Like, it, it, it almost feels like things come to Gukesh during this tournament. Okay, white plays h3. Black can actually take on f3. It's actually not a bad move at all, um, and it damages white's center control, but he's like, why would I do that? I'm just gonna... I have the only light squared bishop on the board. I mean, retreating obviously makes sense, too. I had to say, I've placed king e2, and Gukesh is like, okay... <laughs> like he's like I don't really know why you put the knight there uh, now the knight has to go back I mean white has made no progress like look I'm gonna go back to the position after the move f6 white it, I mean basically white just went here and here I mean you go here that's all that's all that happened right meanwhile Gukesh is still making improvements he's preventing g4 he's getting a getaway square for his bishop also g5 g4 for black is on the way bishop back to g3 bishop e7 and Gukesh just makes a bunch more improvements solidifies the c-file, he's basically playing against this capture, Fedoseyev now opens up the position, but Gukesh seals the center shut, and even though Fedoseyev's pawn is running away, and for a brief moment he is a pawn up, knight b6, very simple corralling, rook a5, and white just has nothing. White cannot go forward ever again. None of white's pieces can move forward. You say, Levy, what about the pawn? Yes, and that's about it, and then black is simply going to carve up the position. Fedoseyev trying his best to reposition. Here comes the crushing hammer blow from Gukesh. This is like when you knock the opponent down in UFC and you follow it up with an absolute haymaker. I'm talking like Dan Henderson, all right? ED, ED, and pretty soon the white position completely collapses. Bishop b4 is a beautiful discovered check by black. The rook on e8 hits the king. We pick up some material, and the rest is a matter of technique, as they say, because Gukesh could win this position with his eyes closed and probably dangling off of a cliff. Hopefully that is not, you know, his next hobby that he picks up. The game goes 48 moves. Fedoseyev resigns. And this was the first of two victories that clinched the gold medal for the Indian uh, men's team. I will tell you uh, a little bit more. Gukesh finished this tournament with probably the greatest Olympiad performance of all time. Vladimir Kramnik, by the way, controversial man right now in chess, but in his heyday was incredible. Uh, Vladimir Kramnik once went eight and a half out of nine in the Olympiad. Gukesh just went nine out of 10 on board one. This might single-handedly be the greatest board one performance of all time. Uh, his performance rating, according to analytics, is 3,060. It is... I think the second greatest tournament performance in history, now granted ratings are different at different points in history, the greatest performance is 2014 Fabiano Caruana. I have a video on this channel, it's called the greatest chess winning streak of all time. Uh, Gukesh is now 2,794. His ELO is 2,794. He's 18 years old. He might break the record for the youngest 2800. I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember exactly the month and everything, but he's very, very close. He's number five in the world. It's crazy, by the way, that there's four players that are better than him. And he is 70 points higher rated than the world champion Ding Li Ren, who he has to play in two months' time. I think right now Gukesh is going to go into a chamber. He's going to get, first of all, he's going to have to do some media because India is going to pop off. Uh, also, he looks like a, like a movie star. Like, he has the... He has, like, the beard of, like, a famous actor. You know what I mean? Like, if, if I saw Gukesh in, like, a famous Bollywood, like, series, I'd be like, oh, obviously, it's Gukesh. Duh. But he also, I mean, he he's going to do a bunch of media. Then he's going to go into a, a chamber, study chess for two months. There is a lot of pressure on this young man for the World Chess Championship. He has to win. India is at a boiling point of chess right now. They have, they have like, a hundred grandmasters at this point. The, the, the culture that Vishy Anand has built... And, you know, credit to everybody, all the coaches and all the, all the players, he's got to win this world championship. And I know that's a lot of pressure, <laughs> but if he does, oh my goodness. I mean, it's going to be sensational. And I have two more games to show you. First of all, uh, the Indian women's team was in a very close race with Kazakhstan, with Team USA. USA and Kazakhstan were playing against each other. So the, uh, if Kazakhstan beat USA, uh, they, they actually get first as well. Uh, the Indian women's team showed up. Divya Deshmukh, very, very popular at the moment. Very close to being a grandmaster as well. I think she's one norm away. She might be two norms away on like obscure technicalities, but she plays, uh, they're playing against Azerbaijan. She plays the English opening. Her opponent plays e5 like this. g3, knight, c6, and the system with bishop to b4. Now here, there are many moves. There are d, knight d5, knight f3, etc. Here Divya plays e4. Um, which is a system, and uh, you know, you're trying to put the knight on e2, you're kind of temporarily giving up the d4 square, but you're suppressing all of this. Uh, black plays d6 after some six minutes of thought, which is a totally reasonable move. 
But in many of these positions, the bishop actually goes back to c5, black plays a5 uh, or a6, and uh, you fight for the dark squares. Black goes bishop g4, obviously nothing wrong with this move, h3 by divya, bishop takes, now knight takes. This is actually kind of a, a tough position to play for black, even though the computer somehow gives black an advantage, which to me doesn't make any sense. Black gave up a bishop, so white has the bishop pair. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. You have the bishop pair, and white is trying to play for the center. Now, black plays pretty reasonably. Black plays a5, bishop c5. Divya plays d3. And clearly going for kind of a long haul game. She's going to slowly improve. And what makes this position nice to play with white is that white controls all the pawn play. White can play on the queen side with a3, b4. White can play in the center with d4. White can play on the king side with f2, uh, f4. So there are, you know, many, many possibilities. Um, now, again, the computer always says the position is equal. Okay, fine. Bishop d4 is the move black chooses, which is wrong. Instead, apparently, black should play h6, which I can't really explain to you. Uh, or knight f8, knight e6, which I can explain to you with the idea of, you know, but she goes here. This move is actually not great because even though black plugs the center, right? Black plugs the center, which was clearly her idea. Like the idea is that now white can't really do anything in the center of the board. Um, white now has f uh, free play. So white can play b3, then white can play a3, then white can play king h2, and then white can play rook b1, trying to play b4. If black ever plays c5, the diagonal opens up, so you kind of don't want that. Divya slowly waits and now has taken control of the position and is ready with b4. And, and, and white is just doing whatever she wants here. The black knight on d7 really doesn't have anywhere to go uh, because white will play b4, completely controlling it. If it goes to f6, okay, congratulations, you went to f6. There is nothing there. By the way, white can even consider g4 in many positions. White can even consider it like a, a, just a straight up attack, by the way, with h4 and g5. So you do have to be careful how you do this. Uh, black in this position... Uh, locks the position. I said a long time ago c5 was incorrect because now the bishop will always be open. We get rook a1, and now black here plays a concept which is, which is very common. When your rooks see each other on the same file like this, sometimes you want to move your rook up so it gets captured. Uh, but this is just the wrong moment because after takes takes e5, b7 is falling and the b pawn becomes a pass pawn. So white now has a pawn that is just queening momentarily. Black tries to defend it. It simply doesn't work. And uh, a piece falls, and Divya just now has to convert a position where she's up a bishop. She is more than capable of doing that. She just has to not blunder anything. And even though the nerves are high, and the team might win the Olympic gold in a moment, she converts it in 39 moves. Rook d1 is simply on the way. The king will walk over. White is just up a bishop. Rook and bishop versus rook is a draw, if you know the defensive technique. But rook and bishop and three pawns versus rook, bishop, and three pawns is not a draw. And India obliterates in the final round three and a half to half and Kazakhstan unable to break through Team USA. It was ultimately a two to two draw. So Kazakhstan one point out gets the silver medal and I think USA got bronze. There might have been a tie there, but whatever, bronze schmanz. No, obviously a very good effort, but India with the gold medal. And um, I, listen, I'm going to end this recap by telling you a, a little bit more about the man who called me the best chess influencer in the world, my man Arjun Eregaisi. First of all, he has exquisite taste, dare I say. Uh, and uh, Arjun Eregaisi is a cowboy of chess. Like, he's 2780. And also in this tournament, he is, he is destroying. Like I said, Gukesh was 9 out of 10. Going into this game, Gukesh ended the Olympiad 9 out of 10. Eric Icy played one more game than Gukesh. Going into this game, he's 9 out of 10. And his rating is 2,795. And yet, with the black pieces in the final round, in a game which is a don't-lose game, as long as India scores points, they're going to win the gold medal, he plays the Scandinavian defense on the final round on the biggest stage of the Olympics of chess. The man plays the Scandinavian. I mean... A man after my own heart. By the way, Gotham Scandinavian course is fantastic, dare I say. Knight c3, d4. Uh, oops, knight c3, queen d6, d4. And now he plays g6. Notice he does not play queen a5, which, by the way, I recommend. I think queen a5 is a fantastic Scandinavian, but it's a little bit too explored. And I think at this level, it's easy for white to get an advantage. Instead, uh, Eregaisi brings his opponent into a position with queen b6, by the way. like, I mean, the move is, the move is uh, queen b6. White plays a4, which is a, a very common idea, uh, but a little bit less popular than c4. Eregaisi plays a6, knight a3. And here, the best move for black, according to engine analysis, is bishop g4. After bishop e6, knight c4, 
the computer gives an overwhelming advantage to white uh, because Gukesh did not play queen before check. I, I keep saying Gukesh. I'm like, I, it's because they're both 2790, okay? And I got Gukesh on my mind. Eric Geisy, Eric Geisy is supposed to play queen before, knight d2, and play. Instead, he just plays the very natural bishop g7, and the engine gives a plus 1.6 advantage if white consolidates the position. Why? Because white just has two bishops, white has more space, white is going to go c3, a5, and just be very, very happy. But this is the type of style that Eric Icy plays. Eric Icy is like a bull rider. He waves the red flag, and he brings the opponent on, and he loves a fight. Like, he does not mind. He's like a poker player. I mean, it's crazy. He has nerves of steel. Most people would never accept a position like this, but he believes in himself. And again, the plan here for white is not to play slowly. It's to play quickly and to play rookie one and then g3 and put the bishop on the diagonal. And Jan Subelge plays c3. This very natural looking move lowers white's advantage by an entire point. Eric Icy now quickly lashes out with c5. Then brings the queen to c7. And now white doesn't have enough time to get the optimal setup with the bishop on f4. So dc, queen c5, queen d4 offering a queen trade, and he plays rook c8. And still white is better because he has two bishops and he has a queenside pawn majority of three pawns versus two, which is supposed to be a traditional advantage. He keeps trying to move forward, but suddenly the advantage is gone. The knight does not belong on e5, and lo and behold, the structure is damaged. The bishops now no longer have any targets, and white is down 30 minutes on the clock. Arjun Aragaisi has officially taken over. And when Arjun Eric Icy takes over a game, like he outplays you from the opening where he gave you a small advantage to get an imbalance, it's just bad news. Knight c6, there's a trade. Look at Arjun's structure. Everything is on a light square. Why is everything on a light square? Like pawns, because he doesn't have a light squared bishop, so the pawn structure counteracts the light squared bishop for white. He's going to bring the doubled rooks. There they are. Not doubled, but at least putting some pressure. Um, rook d1, rook d7, just holding, playing tennis, putting the knight in the center. Now, Literally every black piece except the bishop, which cannot go in a light square, is on a light square. I mean, you talk about a beautiful position. Now he's like, all right, do something. White goes here. He's kicking out the bishop. He's rerouting the bishop to the f5 square. Now he's doubling up. Now he is advancing with his pawns, right? There's the advancement. White's now down to 10 minutes on the clock. g4, taking more space away from him. Knight goes back to d5. Now there is no bishop advantage. And the pawn structure is terrible because white has five out of six pawns on the dark squares, which don't work with his bishop. Black has five out of six pawns on the light squares, which do work with his bishop. And Arjun Erigaisi, smooth like butter, picks up a pawn, picks up another pawn. We're going to an end game. And what I found hilarious in this game is that it was a four on one side and two on the other, but it's, it's simply losing. You cannot be down this level of pawns in the end game. The pawns are too fast. If rook takes g3, uh, h2. There it is. Check. E5 is mate. Instead of losing the rook and then getting promoted, Arjun Erigaisi wins by checkmate. Team India wins the gold medal in the men's and the women's. And Arjun Erigaisi is 2,797. And he is now the third highest rated player in the world. Third, behind Magnus and Hikaru. Number four is now Fabiano Caruana. We haven't had a top three not named Magnus, Fabiano, or Hikaru in years. Arjun is 27.97. Gukesh is playing for the world championship, and he's lower rated than Arjun. I'm not taking anything away from him. I'm just saying Arjun never had a chance in the last candidates. And this is also why the candidates tournament might need to go. The candidates tournament in chess is a tournament where through various... Um, the amount of times you can spin a hula hoop around your waist while juggling, uh, uh, juggling uh, f uh, fiery avocados and, and all sorts of other extreme challenges. In chess, historically, the candidates has been an eight-player tournament, double round robin, which determines who plays for the World Chess Championship. But I would argue the World Chess Championship is obsolete. We got to get these, we got to get a circuit of tournaments that lasts in the calendar year and is a knockout system, just like tennis. We can have a ranking system with the amount of points you get for winning, this just goes to show you this is all absurd. Arjun Arigais, he's 2,800. And he didn't even get a chance to play in the last candidates. And guess what? We got Prague, who's 2,750. Prague was a superstar at this Olympiad. Vidit Gujarati had a monster Olympiad. You go down the list, it is crazy that players rise to top three in chess and haven't even had a chance to play for the World Championship. And we're going to save that discussion for another point. India, on fire. Two gold medals. Superstars in the making. Grandmasters being minted every single week. Gukesh is playing for the World Chess Championship.
70 points higher rated than the sitting world champion. All signs point to the fact that he is an overwhelming favorite. Before this Olympiad, I would not have said the same. I would have said it was maybe 55, 45, 60, 40. Matches are different. Ding has the experience. And I still do say all of that. But everything is pointing to the fact that if a good informed Gukes shows up, India may very well have a second world champion and the youngest ever of all time. But we will find out in two months. For now, congratulations. Massive congratulations, not just to Team India, but also all the coaches, all the supporters. Chess Base India with their incredible coverage and Vishy Anand for the chess culture that he has instilled ever since his career began, was going on, ended. What can I say? Just incredible. Incredible, incredible, incredible. That's all I have. I got to check out or else I'm going to get hit with a lay fee. Much love. Massive congratulations. Get out of here.